Hey, Cypher here. As many of you may already know, I'm quite involved in Las Vegas history. I've done a lot of work on it, and my favorite episode on this channel is the history of the place. Maybe because I don't have to hear my own voice, though I did write the script. So I've wanted to cover Las Vegas movies for a while, and it's finally time to start. There's three of them. Listed in order of best to worst, they are Casino, Aviator, and the movie I'm starting with today, Bugsy. As a prominent Las Vegas historian says about the film, As I started learning the history of Southern Nevada, of Las Vegas, I started realizing just how bad Bugsy was. There's just not enough words in the dictionary to tell you how bad it is. The way to not understand the history is to think that Bugsy Siegel showed up in the middle of the desert and said, let there be flamingo, and everything grew up out of the sand. It did not. Bugsy Siegel was a thug. He came into town in the late 1930s. He forced his way in here. You know, Bugsy Siegel was so bad at building it and opening it that he got shot by his partners. Mm, you know, it wasn't that he was this great visionary. He was a thug and a fool and a psychopath. Sorry, it's a terrible movie. If you want to learn the history of Las Vegas, don't watch the movie. It's bad. Yeah, Dad went off on a bit of a tirade there. He despises this film, and for good reason. It's truly awful, and the source of a lot of mythology surrounding Las Vegas, that really needs to die like the titular character. So that's what I'm here to do today. Kill off Bugsy's myth once and for all. Don't ever repeat what you just said to me to anybody else. Any normal person you say it to will never take anything you say seriously again. Benjamin Siegel began his long career in crime by his teenage years. He had a rap sheet a mile long before he turned 20, filled with petty theft and assault. A bunch of Jewish kids in Brooklyn got together to form a small mob, with Siegel and his friend Meyer Lansky at its head. This is when Siegel went by the name Bugsy, but he grew to hate the moniker, often beating people in public for uttering it. Soon, they graduated from petty crimes like protection rackets and bootlegging to straight-up murder for hire, and Siegel was the foremost trigger puller of the gang. They became closer to other organized crime outfits through these murders and decided to join forces in 1929 after a big mob summit in Atlantic City, eventually becoming part of the National Crime Syndicate formed by Lucky Luciano. As a result of joining the syndicate, Siegel and Lansky's gang joined several other thugs to form a group known simply as Murder Inc. They were associated with numerous mob hits and kind of just freelance murderers and enforcers, basically the worst of the New York mob. Siegel had to travel a lot to make alibis for his numerous crimes. As such, he ended up in California a few times, so the Syndicate sent him to Los Angeles to make the gangs there conform to the larger organization through a wire service for gambling. By the late 1930s, Siegel secured Mickey Cohen and Jack Dragna's allegiance to the Syndicate. From the gambling alone, they were sending back one half to a million dollars a day. It was hugely lucrative, and they branched out into prostitution and arms sales. Siegel even met with Hermann Göring, Joseph Goebbels, and Benito Mussolini during his arms sales. Partially through escaping a murder charge, he became famous as a well-known personality in Hollywood, and he extorted all of his relationships there for loans he never repaid. With all this money flowing into mob coffers, it was inevitable that they'd start extorting legal Nevada gambling. And Siegel was the progenitor of that in Las Vegas. Nevada made gambling legal in 1931, but it took a decade before Bugsy made headway in Vegas. Regulators wouldn't let someone with obvious mob connections finance a new casino, but the mob managed to coerce the sale of the El Cortez for $600,000 in 1945 which firmly placed it as the first mob-owned casino in Las Vegas. Down the road and outside the city limits, a couple of resort casinos popped up, beginning at the same time as the El Cortez was built in 1941. This was the start of today's Strip. An LA mogul named Billy Wilkerson started the third of these resort casinos that he named the Flamingo. As the project ran into financial problems, Siegel made Wilkerson an offer he couldn't refuse. 
so Wilkerson sold a majority stake in the project to the mob in late 1945, before skipping the country for a few months. Siegel took over the halfway completed project and probably embezzled funds for his lavish LA lifestyle. The casino opened in December of 1946, directly under the control of Siegel. That went poorly and they closed down after just a month of being open. Later in 1947, Siegel reopened the Flamingo with a better showing, but he couldn't enjoy the benefits for long. A mob meeting in Havana, Cuba condemned Siegel. Lenski couldn't save his old friend from the wrath of the mob bosses. It was probably Virginia Hill, Siegel's then mistress, who ratted him out to the mob bosses. And it was in her house that Siegel stayed in while she flew off to Paris. A hitman unloaded a full magazine into Siegel as he lounged on her couch. That same day, Mo Sedway and Gus Greenbaum simply walked into the Flamingo and seized control for the mob. From then on, the mob mostly took a hands-off approach to casinos in Las Vegas. They'd finance projects and skim profits off the top, rather than directly interfere in most day-to-day -day operations. As businessmen and legitimate investors became more willing to finance gambling, the mob lost influence steadily, beginning with Howard Hughes buying up Las Vegas casinos and helping to foster corporate ownership of real estate in the late 1960s. Bugsy was a murderous thug who left a mark on Las Vegas, but not as much as his myth would have you believe. Siegel's dealings are muddled in mystery. He was a mobster who was assassinated before he could write anything about himself. So we only have the stories of others to go off of, legal documentation, and investigative records. The most significant work that pieced a lot of this stuff together was The Greenfelt Jungle in 1963. Unfortunately, the authors heavily sensationalized much of the story, just like journalists have a tendency to do. And generations of Las Vegas historians keep needing to counteract the misconceptions people took from that book. But of course, people don't wait for diligent research. No, they just push crap wherever they see a hole to fill. And there's plenty of holes in the desert. As Las Vegas historian Hal Rothman once wrote, Las Vegas is a city of illusion. It is designed to pull the wool over your eyes, to make you suspend disbelief, to pull you into the illusion so completely that you honestly believe it's true. The Las Vegas that people such as these visit is five miles long and eight blocks wide. The problem is that they can't see the reality for the baggage they bring with them. Visiting filmmakers and journalists come prepared to see the city and its people in a certain way, and in a place devoted to illusion, it is not hard to find what you came looking for. Yeah, there's a lot of Las Vegas myths out there, and this film is one of the worst perpetrators. So here are some general myths I've seen way too often. The mob did not create Las Vegas or the Strip, nor did they ever run the town. They came in well after Vegas gambling was already a thing. There were gambling halls as soon as the railroad town opened in 1905, and the mob never controlled a majority of casinos throughout the valley. Bugsy was not a visionary. He was a thug who conned Billy Wilkerson out of the Flamingo. Yes, you could see the aftermath of nuclear tests from downtown Vegas, but that was merely because the cloud rose so high. The tests were nearly a hundred miles away as the crow flies, with several mountain ranges in between. So there wasn't much of a spectacle to see from that far away. Wrong! It was like a distant forest fire with a more distinct cloud. And finally, Las Vegas was never a Wild West town. It was probably the safest city in the county for decades after its establishment. Four years after the railroad between SoCal and Salt Lake City created Vegas as a rail yard, residents formed Clark County, placing the sheriff in the county seat of Las Vegas, which meant it had the most law enforcement in that part of the state from a very early time. If you want a good example of what the Wild West in Southern Nevada actually looked like, though we can argue about the applicability of the term at any point in history. I made an episode out of a conference presentation about such an event, which the topic I hope to someday include as a chapter in my dissertation. In either case, Las Vegas was not some lawless town. Also, it's not called Las Vegas Police. That hasn't existed since 1973. It's called Metro now because so many regions are apart, including the county land that the Strip is on. 
Remember, the Strip isn't in the city of Las Vegas. Anyone spouting all of these myths hasn't done the slightest bit of research necessary to talk about Las Vegas history, which has several historians working on it. And we basically all know each other, at least tangentially. So please stop this nonsense. Movies like Bugsy only perpetuate these lies. 1991 was a terrible year for historical films, since both This BS and JFK were nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. Bugsy, Mark Johnson, Barry Levinson, Warren Beatty producer. JFK, A. Kitman Ho, and Oliver Stone producer. You suck. Thank goodness it was one of the years a fiction movie took the award, because both this and JFK are terrible. You're so naive. You're a loser. So let's get my begrudging praise out of the way quickly. Generally, what this movie gets right is Siegel's time in SoCal. Considering that's about half of the movie, that's a pretty good chunk. Dragna and Cohen are spot-on characterizations, and generally the fact that Siegel kinda commanded them is correct. Now the way he did this is up for debate, but however the movie makers want to navigate those questions is fine by me. Heck, they even show Siegel's obsession with Hollywood, or how he was acquitted of murder in 1942 for the 1939 murder of his rat friend. As you might tell from those dates, the movie kinda squishes time. It's gotta cover a decade in a matter of an hour, which is fine so long as there isn't anything blatantly misleading. Such as this. Great jokes about carting people to the gas chamber? Hey, you know me, Ben. I stay out of politics. That comes before stuff that happened prior to World War II. Yet the American public didn't know about gas chambers until afterward, and they weren't even used until 1942. That inaccuracy doesn't seem too bad, but it's quite revealing actually, which is hilarious because the movie had a golden opportunity that it failed miserably. One of the subplots is Bugsy planning to assassinate Mussolini. You are going to kill Mussolini personally in the middle of a war? That is the most... It's shown as just another harebrained scheme of this mobster with his head in the clouds. But firstly, it's completely false. But second, they could have shown what he was actually rumored to have been planning. The assassination of Goebbels and Goring. It's just a rumor, but it plays into Siegel being part of the Jewish mob and all that. He apparently was quite friendly with them when they met in the 1930s, but that probably soured after Kristallnacht and the ghettoization of German and Polish Jews. But they had to make it about Mussolini for some reason. Like, how difficult is this? But that's just a rather vapid mistake. It gets way worse. Then there's the film's depiction of Virginia Hill. She's pulled off a couple of million of loose change for herself from this here deal. No one who studies the mob believes she embezzled the $2 million, though many think Siegel used her name instead of his. She was part of the mob until her death a couple decades later, which makes this statement at the end particularly unnerving. The movie is implying that she committed suicide because of her feeling bad about Bugsy. But if that's the case, she sure took a long time to get around to it. Hill supposedly committed suicide in 1966, though there's a lot of conjecture about whether it was actually suicide. Either way, that's a long way off from 1949, when Siegel was killed in her house. She's even depicted as being scared of flying, but that's precisely what she did just before his assassination. This movie is a mess, but that's just your typical Hollywood inability to tell stories. The problem is the movie really reveals its hand when it comes to Las Vegas. That's the reason the so-called Beard of Knowledge hates this movie so vehemently. He wasn't joking about that impression. Just look at this clip. I got it! It came to me like a vision! Like a religious epiphany! I am talking about the single best idea I ever had. Yeah, Bugsy just imagines the strip into being. Oh, and it's way worse than just that. Like, they show the El Cortez like this. You really want to be associated with this kind of dump? I think you should get rid of it. What the hell? Back when I was a draftsman, I actually designed some of the renovations for that building, and not even the biggest ignoramus could misconstrue this for that. 
They even say the Hoover Dam isn't built yet. That when the Hoover Dam is finished, electrical power is going to be available on a massive scale in Las Vegas. That was finished half a decade before the opening of the El Cortez. They're making Vegas look like it's 1906, the same year Siegel was born. Holy crap, that's stupid. And the filmmakers just keep digging deeper. They don't bother showing the other two casinos that preceded the Flamingo on the Strip, instead portraying it like there's just open desert out there in 1945. And worst of all, they make it seem like Siegel just made the Flamingo from scratch. Not a mention of Billy Wilkerson whatsoever. Honestly, I'm surprised Wilkerson's estate didn't sue this film for defamation. He died in 1962, so maybe they thought it was too late to prove material damages, but there has to be a tangible cost to this lie besides the constant frustration of historians. Siegel did not design the Flamingo, nor did he make drastic changes once he forced Wilkerson off the project. Hell, he didn't even name the place. That was Wilkerson. Siegel should be remembered not as some maverick with the ideal of the Las Vegas Strip in his head, but for what he was. A mobster who murdered and cajoled his way into taking primary ownership of a couple casinos for the mob to exert undue influence for the next couple decades. That's it. Yeah, he's important to Las Vegas history, but he was not some misunderstood genius. He was a thug. An influential one, but only because he was a thug at the right time and place to take advantage of a cash-strapped city in her hour of need. I'm talking about Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada. <laughs> from here in Nevada, the way I just pronounced the name of this state is what this next story is about. We haven't always said it the same way, and there is a correct way. Memo to all those political candidates trying to win votes in the silver state. Nevada, not Nevada. Nobody says it the other way. It has to be Nevada. 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 And you know what I said? You know what I said? So nice to be back in Nevada. We are so happy to be here. Nevada, Nevada, Nevada! Nevada! I know how to bounce back from my mistakes. Nevada!